All right, if you will, uh, turn in your Bibles to, uh, we're going to read a couple of different passages, 2 Kings 17, 22, and 23, and then 23, chapter 23, 26, 27. And just stand with me, we've got to have it on the screen for you, but this, this is, you're going to see this again later on, this is really some of the key verses in the book of 2 Kings. So in 2 Kings 17, 22 and 23, the people of Israel walked in all the sins that Jeroboam did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight as he had spoken by all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until this day, that is until the day that this was, this was written. We'll talk about the date on that in a little while. Then 2 Kings 23, 26 and 27, Still the Lord did not turn from the burnings of his great wrath, by which his anger was kindled against Judah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah also out of my sight, as I have removed Israel. And I will cast off this city that I have chosen, Jerusalem, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. Well, we just read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And obviously these two brief passages tell of the doom of the northern kingdom and the doom of the southern kingdom. It's very instructive, very instructive. You typically would read or want to read in the Scripture that the people walked in the ways of the Lord. Not so in the northern kingdom. They walked in all the sins that their king did. They did not depart from them. You remember we've read through at this point, you know, this this law shall not depart from you. Instead, they have gone so far astray that they will not depart from the sinful ways. And then I think another thing that's instructive, and this explains some of the Psalms, the the M-O-U-R, mourning Psalms, when they're in captivity. In the second passage, the Lord says in verse 27, I will remove Judah also out of my sight. And when they were in captivity, they sang things like, on the willow we hung up our harps. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? They, They had the sense that God had abandoned them, was not looking upon them for their good, their benefit. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, 2 Kings. Remember initially, this is the king's is one historical document. It's broken into first and second, uh, primarily, because of a space on a scroll. And so this is 2 Kings. It continues, when, if you read the end of the first, into the, into the second, uh, it's this continued interruption. And it sort of reminds you like a Dickens novel, this tale of two kingdoms, which we began reading in 1 Kings. The kingdoms of Israel and Judah... Uh, seem to be intent on heading into a collision course with captivity as the glory of the once united kingdom becomes increasingly remote. Those, it's, it's increasingly in the rearview mirror. Division leads to decline, ultimately ends in, in this double uh, deportation. The northern kingdom first, the southern kingdom next. Israel's captured and dispersed by the Assyrians while Judah's led off to captivity in, in, in Babylonia. In spite, this is in spite of, by the way, the, the best efforts of, of uh, some faithful prophets to preach the warning of God upon them. Uh, particularly Elisha, uh, who preached to short, sort of shock the nations back to their religious senses, but it, it was too late in terms of what was coming for them. One writer said this, the kingdom divided in 1 Kings becomes the kingdom dissolved in 2 Kings. Made the observation that God's patience is long. He is long-suffering. God's pleading is, is persistent. He kept sending prophet after prophet. But ultimately, ignore God's warning, presume upon his patience long enough, and if you're his, you will experience the severe hand of his love. What some today call tough love in parenting circles. I want us to watch what we saw last week. We're going to watch again 
the Bible Project's video on the Kings and see, just be reminded of First Kings and get ready to go into Second Kings tonight. The books of First and Second Kings, although they're two separate books in our Bibles, they were originally written as one book telling a unified story that continues on from the book of Samuel that came before it. So David has unified the tribes of Israel into a kingdom, and God promised that from his line would come a messianic king who would establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promises made to Abraham. So the book of Kings tells the story of the long line of kings that came after David, and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, they run the nation of Israel right into the ground. The book is designed to have five main movements. The story begins and ends focus on Jerusalem, first with Solomon's reign and the construction of the temple, and then in this last section ending with Jerusalem's destruction and Israel's exile to Babylon. And the story leading up to this tragedy is what makes up the center three sections, which explain how Israel split into two rival kingdoms, how God tried to prevent the corruption of Israel by sending the prophets, and how exile became the unavoidable consequence of Israel's sin. The book opens with two chapters about the kingdom passing from the aging David to his son Solomon. And David's final words to Solomon, they're very similar to those of Moses and Joshua and Samuel to the people. It's a call to remain faithful to the commands of the covenant and to give allegiance to the God of Israel alone. But David's words ring somewhat hollow here because David and Solomon then go on to conspire how they're going to consolidate this new kingdom through a whole series of political assassinations. It's not off to a great start. Solomon's brightest moment comes when he asks God for wisdom to lead Israel, and he even completes David's dream to make a temple for the God of Israel. Here the story actually stops and describes the design of this temple in detail, just like the tabernacle design in the Torah. There's all these gold and jewels and depictions of angels and fruit trees. It's all symbolism echoing back to the Garden of Eden. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells with his people. But no sooner does Solomon finish the temple that he makes some really horrible choices and the kingdom falls apart. He starts marrying the daughters of other kings, hundreds of them, for political alliances. And then he adopts their gods and introduces the worship of those gods into Israel. Solomon then accumulates huge amounts of wealth. He builds a huge army. He even institutes slave labor for all of his building projects. Now if you go back to the Torah and look at God's guidelines for Israel's kings in Deuteronomy 17, Solomon is breaking every one. So by the time that he dies, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, more than he does his father David. The next section of the book opens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, acting just like his father. It's a very sad story of greed and lust for power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this. They rebel and secede and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern kingdom, Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David. And now this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will be Samaria eventually. Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with Solomon's temple in the south. He puts a golden calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf, it's all quite explicit. From this point on, the story goes back and forth from north to south, tracing the fate of both kingdoms. Each one had about 20 successive kings, and as the author introduces each king, he evaluates their reign by a few criteria. Did they worship the God of Israel alone, or did they promote the worship of other gods? Did they deal with idolatry among the people? And did they remain faithful to the covenant like David, or do they become corrupt and unjust? And according to these criteria, the author finds no good kings in northern Israel, 0 for 20. And then in southern Judah, only 8 out of 20 get a positive rating, which connects to another huge purpose in this book, and that's to introduce the role of the prophets, key figures in Israel's history. So in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. Rather, they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light to the nations, that they should obey the commands of the Torah, and so the prophets challenged Israel to repent and follow their God.
In these center sections for each king, God then raises up prophets to hold them accountable. And the most prominent prophets are the northern ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. Elijah was a wild man of a prophet living out in the desert, and his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god Baal over Israel. And so in a famous story, Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was real. So they both build altars and pray to their gods, but only the god of Israel answers with fire. After this, Ahab uses his royal power to murder an Israelite farmer and then steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice and he announces the downfall of his house. Elijah eventually passes the mantle of his prophetic leadership to a young disciple named Elisha, who asks for two times the authority of Elijah. And what's fascinating here is how the author, he's recounted seven miraculous feats for Elijah, and then he offers stories of 14 acts of power from Elijah. Both prophets were clearly remarkable men, and they played the same role, confronting Israel's kings for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately, they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from apostasy. In the next section, the northern kingdom is rocked by a bloody revolution started by a king named Jehu, who destroys Ahab's family. And although Jehu was at first commissioned by God, his violence just gets out of control, and it creates the spiral of political assassinations and rebellions from which Israel never recovered. Coup follows coup after Jehu, and each king follows other gods, allows horrible injustice. It all leads up to 2 Kings chapter 17. The big bad empire of Assyria swoops down and takes out the northern kingdom altogether. In the capital city of Samaria, it's conquered and the Israelites are exiled and scattered throughout the ancient world. Now chapter 17 is key. The author stops the story and offers this prophetic reflection on what's just happened. He blames the downfall of the northern kingdom on the idolatry and covenant unfaithfulness of Israel and its kings. And so God has allowed them to face the consequences of their decisions. The final movement of the book tells the story of the lone southern kingdom. And here we meet some very heroic kings like Hezekiah, who trusts God when the armies of Assyria come knocking on Jerusalem's door. Or Josiah, who discovers this lost scroll of the Torah in the temple. So he starts reading it. He's convicted and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry and Canaanite influences from the land. But... Judah is just too far gone. The king, right in between these two, Manasseh, he's the worst by far. So he not only introduces the worship of idol statues into the Jerusalem temple, he also institutes child sacrifice. And so God sends prophets to say, the time is up, Israel has reached the point of no return. The final chapters tell the story of the Babylonian empire coming to invade Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people and the royal line of David off into exile. And so the story ends leaving us wondering, is God done with Israel? Is he done with the line of David? Well, the final paragraph zooms about 40 years forward into the exile, and it tells a very odd story. It's about Jehoiakim, a descendant from David, who would have been king if he was back in Jerusalem. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life, and the book ends. So it's not much, but it's a story that gives a glimmer of hope that God has not abandoned the line of David. So the question now is how is God going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, to David? How is he going to bless the nations and bring the messianic kingdom? And to answer those questions, you have to read on into the wisdom and the prophetic books. But for now, that's the book of Kings. Okay, so there's a little rehearsal, review of that. Uh, We'll find when we come back to take up the Chronicles that they, the Chronicles originally were at the end of what you and I understand to be the Old Testament. It was sort of a, a summary of Israel's history. It falls in our Bibles now in a little different place, but we'll look at those and see how it kind of recounts the history that we're going through now. And then we head into, into um, on the verges of the wisdom literature, uh, the poetic literature, and then the, the writings of the prophets themselves. So 2 Kings, just to give you a, a, a survey of that. Um, the, 
this book traces the history of the divided kingdom in chapters 1 to 17 and the history of, of, the, of the surviving kingdom or the end of it in chapters 18 to 25. Uh, let's just look real quickly. Uh, chapters 1 through 17 uh, record the story of Israel's corruption uh, as just one after another of these bad kings emerge from Ahaziah to Hosea. And we're, I've got a graph here that we're going to look at at the end that I'm not sure how clear it's going to be when all is said and done to sort of lay out for you the timeline of the prophets and the kings. But so this, is, this traces their, uh, their downfall. Uh, the situation in Judah, the southern kingdom, during this time between Jehoram and Ahaz, that is in chapters 1 to 17, a little better, but it's not, uh, not ideal by far. Uh, this time in the northern kingdom, these, this dark time where you have all these king after king that's corrupt, uh, the only bright spot in it really uh, is the ministries of uh, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, Elijah, of course, has that incredible encounter we've talked about uh, with the prophets of Baal. Uh, but Elisha is a man who we're going to see in a little while really is, takes on something of a Christ figure in terms of, of, his, of his demeanor and his, his ministry. Elijah is more of a John the Baptist type. Um, he brings thundering challenges to call the nation to righteousness and recognize the true God. Uh, a lot of miracles. If you've, read, if you've read through it, you know the, uh, the axe head. I mean, it's just, just miracle after miracle under the ministry of Elisha. And he, he asked Elijah for a double portion and took up the mantle of Elijah when, when Elijah was taken up into heaven. And it's through Elisha that God demonstrates um, his, his care. A real, a real grace tone comes through in, in Elisha's uh, promises of God. Uh, his concern for any person who will desire to turn to God. Uh, but, just like Israel rejected Elijah, so they ultimately end up rejecting Elisha. And so he instructs some of his assistants... Uh, to anoint Jehu as king over Israel. And Jehu does uh, put Ahab's descendants to death. He kills Ahab's wife, sons, and also the priests of Baal. Uh, he doesn't kill the daughter, unfortunately, and we'll see how that unfolds. The problem with, with Jehu is even though he, he is instituting some measure of reform, uh, he does not depart from the calf worship originally set up by Jeroboam. And when the house of Ahab falls, as it does, the alienation of Israel and Judah uh, intensifies and the nations correspondingly get weaker and weaker then Israel's enemies begin to get the upper hand. In Judah, southern kingdom, uh, Jezebel's daughter Adaliah, or Athaliah kills all the descendants of David except for Joash. And then she usurps the throne. But Jehoiada, a priest, eventually removes her from the throne and places Joash, a descendant of David, remember, in power. And Joash... Uh, restores uh, temple worship, and, and it serves God. During this time, there's, there's a lot of movements going on uh, across the world. Syria gains virtual control over Israel, over the northern kingdom. Uh, and, but the people do not cry out to God. They don't, don't really humble themselves and repent. And all, it's almost as if the chastisement of God hardens them. The kings and the people refuse to repent. Uh, there's a season when Jeroboam is restored. Uh, but this, this series of wicked kings in Israel leads to finally its overthrow, its captivity in 722 of the northern kingdom. And then uh, in 
18 to 25, the, the, the surviving kingdom that ultimately gets overthrown, uh, of Israel's kings, not one is righteous in God's sight. All but uh, one of its nine dynasties, think about that, as they move from power, uh, power dynasty to power dynasty, all but one of them are created by murdering the predecessor. In Judah, there's only one dynasty. Remember the prophecy. Son of David. There's only one dynasty. Eight of its 20 kings uh, do what is right in the sight of God. Uh, but it's not enough to forestall or head off Judah's collapse in the Babylonian exile. Of course, once you get to 1825, you're focusing on, on the southern kingdom alone. You're not having to, as you're reading 1 through 17, going back and forth. Now, which one is this talking about? Six years before the overthrow of Israel's capital in Samaria, northern kingdom, Hezekiah becomes king of Judah. And he is a, he's a man of faith and a man of reform. Uh, and there's a season, a brief season, when it seems as if God has relented and, and Judah experiences uh, some blessings and some prosperity. But Hezekiah's reign gives way to Manasseh. And uh, he is so different from his dad. He's so idolatrous that it's his long reign, the reign of Manasseh, that leads to the downfall, uh, downfall of Judah. And even when Josiah comes in after that, and uh, the boy king who institutes reforms, uh, the nation's too far gone. And the four kings who uh, succeed him are, are very wicked. So judgment comes in these, if you know the history of the, of the Jews, judgment comes in, in, in three deportations to Babylon. And the third is in 586. That's why you typically will see that date given for or the Babylonian exile. They, they take two different occasions. And then on the third, uh, Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem and the temple, leaving no two stones on top of another. He sows uh, the ground with salt, the fields with salt, so that they will not produce. But there's woven through all of this, if you, if you read the Old Testament properly, uh, what's called this uh, this doctrine of the remnant. That God will always have a people. He will always have a people. Even when they're taken off into captivity, He will always have a people. Uh, that the seed will not com completely be snuffed out because this is God's promise to usher in the Messiah through, uh, through the son of David. And that's kind of the, the small, if you read in this, the small glimmer of hope. Uh, in all of this, this remnant that he's kept for himself. Uh, as far as the, the timelines, um, the first portion, chapter 1 through 17, uh, takes up Israel and Judah during the reign uh, from Ahaziah through Hosea. Uh, the deportation, as I said, takes place in 722. The timeline of, of this portion of the study is 131 years from, from 853 B.C. to 722. The uh, then the fall of Israel takes place in, the, in that 17th chapter. The surviving kingdom, uh, the last chapters, is, uh, happens in where Judah and the southern kingdom is deported. Timeline's 155 years, 715 to 560. So the fall of Judah is recorded in 2417 to 2530. As far as the introduction title, we talked about that last week, uh, how how these the kings, the book of the kings, got, got its name. Um, and we won't go over that again tonight. But the story is about showing uh, the monarchy, the troubles with the monarchy, the divisions that occur, and how God, and this is a, this is a theme we should be familiar with by now, going back to Genesis, how God promises blessing in the face of covenant, faithfulness and promises judgment in the face of covenant unfaithfulness. The, uh, the author 
the book that we have now was not written uh, by Jeremiah, but probably a contemporary. We said this last week. Uh, the book was written before, Second Kings written before uh, the Babylonian captivity. I've pointed out a while ago to you we read as it is to this day. You have similar literary style. If you, if you, if you know anything about studying books of the Bible, a book like First Kings, Second Kings, we look for, for common phraseology, the use of, of, uh, of order of words, and it's, it's a very common literary style. Uh, even that to the book of Jeremiah, which makes you wonder about his imprint on them. The last two chapters of Second Kings, however, were added to the book after the Babylonian captivity. So you have the corpus of it being written before the captivity, the last two, two after. And uh, we know it couldn't have been Jeremiah then. Uh, the date and the setting, the last recorded event in Second Kings is the release of Jehoiakim in 25, uh, chapter 25, verses 27 to 30. That takes place in 560 B.C. And that gives us our timeline for this second installment of the book of the Kings. Um, what's the theme and the purpose? Well, the theme and the purpose are the same as First Kings, uh, and that is uh, it gives us pivotal events. It's not it's not comprehensive, but it's but it's representative of things that occur. And we're going to see some. By the way, when we get to Chronicles, we're going to see a little more detail. One of the examples will be that that the life of David will be told without any of the any of the things that expose David and his weaknesses. And the same thing is going to be true with some of these other uh, regions. It's a pivotal event in the, in the careers of the kings of Israel and Judah and show how disobedience and rebellion against God led to the failure and overthrow of the monarchy. Um, prophets in here began to play a, a more critical role, the prophets of the Lord. And uh, again, if you've been reading that, you see We've mentioned two. We'll look at some others here. He reminds the kings through the prophets, the mouthpieces of God. That, uh, when, they, when you read in the, the burden of the Lord came to the prophet, it's a, it, the burden is the idea of the Lord putting a heaviness to declare his word no matter the consequences. Uh, Thus saith the Lord. That's a, that's a prophetic utterance that whatever follows uh, is from God. And that's thrown around a whole lot today in some circles where folks feel free to pop up and say that as, a, as preparatory to what they want to say. But in the scripture, when the prophet said that, this is God is speaking to you through us. So they were his, his mouthpieces uh, warning the king, reminding them of their covenant responsibilities. Reminding them that they were, they were his theocratic administrators. The theocracy is a, is a form of government, theos, God. The theocracy is, is a government led by God. And the kings were his representatives. Uh, in fact, you see, uh, what you begin to see developing here is the idea of the king as God's representative and of the priest. We've seen the priest for some time now as God's representative. And the prophet now comes on the scene, this whole idea of prophet, priest, and king. And we've shown you before that it was these offices that formed uh, this picture of the Messiah. That he would come and have a priestly role. That he would come and have a prophetic role. And he would come and reign. And so the prophet, priest, and king, as that develops in Israel's history, is to be a reminder to the people to look to God's Messiah who will be the, com the best combination, the ultimate, ultimate combination of these in himself. But of course, in the role of the prophet, uh, when, the, when the kings did not heed them, and most of the kings did not, if you, if you know anything about the prophets, if you, if you measure the prophets of the Old Testament by today's standards of success, they were all failures, by today's standards, not biblical standards, they were all failures except one, the one that didn't want to succeed. Okay? And that's important to keep in mind that God called upon them to be faithful, to declare his word faithfully. When you think about uh, keys, key word, key phrase, uh, that we use the title for this, the captivities of the kingdom, that's really what 
That's the, that, that captures the essence of 2 Kings. The key verses, passages, we'll just put them up there. I read them to you to begin with. 2 Kings 7, 17, 22, and 23, which speaks about the, the downfall of the northern kingdom. And then 2 Kings 23, 26, and 27, which speaks about the downfall of the uh, southern kingdom. The key chapter is the last chapter in the book as it describes the utter destruction of the city of Jerusalem and its glorious temple. About the only people that are left from the captivity are the poor people. Uh, Babylonians would carry their, uh, the young, uh, the folks that proved to be hopeful, the educated, the, those who could serve and enhance uh, the culture of Babylon. And they would bring them in and try to enculturate them into that, uh, that pagan culture. And many people did that. Some notable people stood against that. Even some, when you read in there, fled for their lives to Egypt, able to escape the, the roundup of the captivity. And this, I found this note here. Hope is still alive, however. When the remnant in the Babylonian captivity, as evil Merodach frees Jehoiakim from prison and treats him kindly. And so now you have member of the house of David who was released, allowed to eat the remainder of his days. If you look at 2 Kings 25, verse 27, and in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month and on the 27th day of the month, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him, and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put off his prison garments, and every day of his life he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king according to his daily needs, so long as he lived. So here you have at the end of the book this very unlikely turn of events. I mean, it's been, it's been doom and gloom and rejection of God and captivity and destruction, and yet... This little light, shaft of light begins to break through at the end of, uh, of 2 Kings. As far as seeing Jesus in this, in this passage, you, you find him in the, in, in the better reflections of the good kings uh, of Judah. Adaliah, the daughter of Jezebel, attempts to destroy the house of David, to wipe them out, eradicate them completely. Yet God remains faithful to his covenant with David. He preserves his lineage. And Jesus the Messiah will ultimately come out of, uh, of the rescue by God, even in the face of someone attempting deliberately to, to trample out uh, David's lineage. And I came across, I mentioned this earlier, I want to read this to you. Elijah uh, is considered a, a type of John the Baptist. And we, if you want to just uh, look, at, look at some verses with me a few minutes. In Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, Jesus says, And if you're willing to accept it, he, speaking of John the Baptist, is Elijah who is to come. Matthew 17, 10 to 12, the disciples ask him, Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And then in Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 17. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, talking about John the Baptist, the forerunner, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom and the, of the just, to make ready the Lord's people prepared. So it's interesting when you, when you put those lenses on and go back and read uh, the ministry of Elijah, and as he transfers uh, to the ministry of Elisha. You look on the timeline, uh, Elisha had a much longer, broader ministry than Elijah had. And just as Elijah seems to be a type of John the Baptist, and Jesus cites that specifically, so Elisha reminds us of Christ. Elijah generally lived apart from the people. Remind you of anyone? Uh, John the Baptist was an Essene, and he, he, was, he was withdrawn typically from from the people. He would make these appearances 
and, and proclaim and preach and challenge and warn and then sort of disappear among the Essene community and those who were following him. Uh, he, he has stressed, Elijah stressed uh, law and judgment and repentance. Elisha, on the other hand, when you read his ministry in 2 Kings, lives among the people and emphasizes grace and life and hope. It's an interesting contrast in the two because you would tend to think that, that Elisha took up the ministry of Elijah and carried it through. But really when Elisha, uh, when, the, when the mantle of Elijah falls on Elisha, he uh, takes a, uh, not, not serving a different God by any means, not marching to a different word, but his, the manifestation of his ministry has a much more uh, gracious tone than did that of Elijah. So in the, in the book of 2 Kings, in addition to the, to the cropping up of the good kings in Judah, in addition to God sparing the house of David when Adaliah uh, determines to uh, exterminate them, you have this figure, Elisha, who, who for us is a type of Christ. What about the contribution uh, to the Bible? Well, as I said, 2 Kings just, it just picks up where 1 Kings left off. It's, it, it completes the history of Israel and Judah as nations. Uh, the kingdom was established in 1 Samuel, consolidated in 2 Samuel. Uh, 1 Kings records the, the division and decline. 2 Kings carries on with its deterioration and destruction. If you want to compare the two uh, just real quickly... Uh, first Kings, we can see, can we see this? Ah, that's, that's off. Sorry, I didn't get them larger. I'll tell you what it says. Though. First Kings opens with David, king of Israel. Second Kings closes with Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. First Kings depicts Solomon's glory. Second Kings, Jehoiakim's shame, of course, until he is elevated. First Kings, the temple built and consecrated. Second Kings, the temple violated and destroyed. First Kings begins with, with blessings for obedience. Second Kings ends with judgment for disobedience. First Kings speaks of, of, of the growth of, hypo, of apostasy, how it's continuing to foment and intensify. Second Kings shows us the consequences of apostasy. And then finally, First Kings, the United Kingdom is divided. Coming out of the glory days of Solomon. Second Kings, the two kingdoms are destroyed. So it's not even, it's bad enough to see the United Kingdom divided in the northern and southern, but in the end of Second Kings, you see both kingdoms destroyed. They are no more. Israel, the northern kingdom, with Samaria, is no more. Judah, the southern kingdom, with, with Jerusalem, is no more. They will come back to Jerusalem sometime later and begin to rebuild in the, in the days of Ezra. And Nehemiah. The theological tone of 2 Kings carries on what 1 Kings did. It stresses God as the sovereign Lord over the history of Israel and other nations. At one point in the, in the record, he, he says, I will raise up my king, Nebuchadnezzar. Interesting, isn't it? My king. Well, Nebuchadnezzar was a, was a wicked Babylonian king. Yes, he was. But in God's hands... He used him as an instrument to punish his people for their sin. And then if you know the record, the, the, the narrative, he turns around and punishes uh, Nebuchadnezzar for being so uh, fierce in his punishment of, of the people of Israel. It's fascinating. See how God, God is that sovereign. He just raises up and deposes at, at the, his sovereign pleasure. He predicts and controls history and uses various nations as his instruments of judgment for Israel's failure to keep the covenant. The king was to act as, as the servant of God by leading the nation into righteousness and fellowship with the Lord. Sadly, in this season, most of the kings perverted the purpose of their office because of their moral and spiritual rebellion. And remember, remember, go back now sometime. We want a king like the rest of the nations have a king. And for the better part of the season of the kings, that's exactly what they got. They got a wicked leader who was more concerned about himself than he was about the glory of God. 
Now, I want us to, I hope this next slide is not as awful as that one. It's a little better. It's just not good at all. The problem is that you have so much to put into a timeline. I don't know if, if I can do this and it mean anything to you. What you, what you have there is the, uh, is the movement, you could read it, <laughs> is the movement showing second. Up at the top is the northern, the, the kings of the northern kingdom. Uh, this is pointless. Let me, let me do this, if you'll, if you'll forgive me. Let me print up a clearer graphic for you to have in your hands. Because I want us to see, before we move into the Chronicles, uh, I want you to see the timeline there and sort of make a connection between what's happening really in their world. Not only the northern kingdom, not only the southern kingdom, but, but the kings of Assyria, the kings of Damascus, the Egyptian pharaohs, and kind of get a picture of, of the movement and see where the prophets were prophesying in this time. Because it's really helpful, it was at least to me, when I was studying through this years ago, to know where Isaiah preached. Where did he prophesy? Where did, to know that Isaiah and Micah were contemporaries. To know that uh, there would be clusters of these prophets that preached in the same general time frame, some not as long as the other. And I, I apologize. I put that on a slide, and it, and it looks great on my computer, but uh, I didn't test it on that screen. And that looks awful there. So forgive me for that. I'll do better. I promise you. So what we'll do, Lord willing, is we'll come back. Uh, not next Sunday, Sunday night. We, we're not meeting on, on, the, on the evening time. We'll come back the following Sunday. I'll have a nice, clean graph in some shape or form and size for you to look at. And we'll begin our session looking at the, the timeline of the kings and the prophets and heading into the Chronicles. And that's what, it, that's what it's known as, is the Chronicles. It's, it's one book. We call it First and Second Chronicles because we weren't there to help them get longer scrolls. Okay. Any questions or comments, observations before we wrap this up?